Hello, fitness business nerds. What's up? Welcome to another episode of the Business for Unicorns podcast. And today, I'm excited to introduce you to a new friend on the podcast. It's Krista Stoker. Hello, Krista. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I'm so good. I'm so good. For for listeners, let me give you a brief little introduction. So Krista Stoker is the co-owner and director of hitting development at S2 Breakthrough, uh, based in Illinois, focused on softball athletes. We'll talk more about that in a second. And Krista's also been a Unicorn Society member for, I think, just over a year now. Is that right? Not even quite. So right? almost. So we're getting, uh, beginning almost, of March. Yeah. Almost God, a year. Oh, that's right. You started a little bit after yes. the start of mm-hmm. the year. Um, well, I'm so excited to, to have you on the podcast because we had you recently as a speaker at one of our Unicorn Society retreats, and we're actually going to cover that topic that you covered, which I'm stoked to talk about, plus a few more things. So thank you for doing this, Chris. I really appreciate it. Yeah, of it. course. Excited. Um, to get the ball rolling, you want to just share a little bit of our listeners about like what is S2 Breakthrough and talk a little bit about how you got into your role as the co-owner. Sure. So S2 Breakthrough is a holistic training facility for softball athletes. So we offer strength and conditioning and skill training. We do a lot of data analysis and data focused training. Um, I was actually a corporate lawyer uh, Mm -hmm. full time. I was in law school when I met my business partner, Ashley, um, and we were coaching the undergrad team at University of Chicago together. She was also on track to be uh, go to law, uh, medical school. So we were mm-hmm. totally not uh, planning to start as do breakthrough, but realized that we had a real passion for the game. And we saw it uh, similarly in our lives in this sort of empowerment of female athlete role. And we really just kept talking about it and finally uh, started building things on the side. And three years into being a lawyer, I left and started mm-hmm. S2 breakthrough. So uh, it's been a roller coaster and definitely not a path that was planned ahead of time, but it's been awesome. Yeah, good for you. I mean, what a leap from being a corporate lawyer to then running your own softball uh, yes. facility. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, well, let's dive in because I know we have lots of things I want to cover. And one of the first things you mentioned when I said, what do you want to talk about today? <laughs> was, you know, one of a great lesson you've learned over the years um, was how to simplify your business and really focus on serving a specific client, a specific niche. But that's not how you started. And I wonder, I think this is a great topic because so many gym owners and listeners, this might be you if you're listening to the podcast now and you're just opening your gym, a very, very common impulse when you first open your gym or really any business is to try to be everything to everyone. You just say yes to everything. So I want personal training, you offer personal training. So I want group training, you offer group training. So I want nutrition coaching, you, want, you do nutrition coaching. Then you also sell supplements and you also have apparel and merch. And then you also do yeah. corporate corporate training down the street because someone asked you once. Right. <laughs> and so, right, and you, we try to be everything to everyone. Uh, and you said that part of your journey at Esther Breakthrough was a little bit like that, where you tried to be everything to everyone and you had to learn over time how to kind of narrow things down. So can you just kind of tell that story a little bit? Because I think the way you all approached it um, is so inspiring. Yeah, for sure. When we started, I remember a really specific conversation that Ashley had with one of her mentors. She was uh, getting her master's in kinesiology. And he said, you have such a unique background. You're both academic backgrounds. We both went to D3 schools, high academics. um, And you just have this really inspiring backgrounds for female athletes. So why don't you focus just on female athletes? And Ashley and I, you know, I remember us like audibly laughing at that (laughs) statement uh, and thinking like, there's no possible way we could just focus on female athletes or just softball that just doesn't exist out there. So when we started, we had baseball, Uh, Ashley worked with adults. We did some training with adults for strength and conditioning. And we had a lot, we tried to hire baseball instructors and we just started realizing We didn't know how to hire those people. We didn't have a knowledge in those people. And so anything, all the turnover we had was really related to, this isn't an area that we have expertise. And I think when we were looking at money and trying to figure out ways to make more money, we always first went to, let's add something. We need to add this, you know, source of income um, instead of really looking just internally at what we did great. And so I think when we really hit our stride, which has been in the last three years, we've been around a long time, but we've totally transformed in the past three years was when we just really got specific about what are we good at? You know, what are me and Ashley good at first as the the owners? And then how do we build a team around that? Um, which is when we got into science and data and this holistic mindset and really empowering female athletes. So uh, we cut everything else. We are just softball. We are just a spe- specific niche of softball. We don't try to really extend beyond that. Um, and that's really where we hit our stride. So by cutting, uh, probably should listen to the mentor a long time ago uh, as a lesson too. Um, but 
by sort of focusing in on that, um, we, we make more money because we can get really, really good at what we do too. So. Yeah. I mean, what a great example. And I, I love that, you know, that where you wound up turning was just like inward and like, what are we good at? We both own this place, you and your business partner, Ashley, you know, what are the things that we want to leverage as our own skills, our own passions, and how do we build off of that? And that meant you actually do less services for a more specific niche, but you get to do them better and, right. you know, and really dive in, which is amazing. Maybe just for, uh, to illustrate what it was like, what are all the things you did early on? What are all the things you used to do that you cut out? Sure. So we gave, um, we did softball and baseball. We did strength and conditioning. We sold them all sort of separately at the mm -hmm. time. We did one-on-one -on -one training. We did um, group training. We worked with adults. We went through a lot of phases where we worked with adults in strength and conditioning. Um, we had things where we would go do camps and we would sort of go out to try to do, you know, camps for other programs. We've done team training Um We've done a lot. And so I think what we look like now is I think sometimes it surprises people. And I think that there's probably a, a, a point where we might go back to some of those things if they really relate to what we do now. But um, we are in the process of we don't work with very many teams at all anymore. We do only individual training. We do no one on one training. Everything is in sort of program setting. They come in and get programs. Um, we only work with supple athletes. We've narrowed the age of supple athlete we work with. So we don't do a lot with like younger ages anymore. Um, so there's a lot we don't do. I just had a mom ask me, would you ever train adults? I'm like, maybe, but probably not, not right now. Um, but we don't do any more adult training. Um, so even our, you know, at the time that we started, our strength and conditioning coach was separate from us. So we had phases where they worked under us. Then we have phases where we subcontracted that out. And even now our staff is all very connected. So even I would say that like no one comes in just for strength and conditioning, no one comes in just for skill training. So even that component is is sort of buttoned up and very related to each other. Yeah, I think I appreciate you listing all of those just because I think uh, for a lot of our listeners, um, it's really helpful to hear like, wow, you really did do a lot of stuff. Right? Yeah, you served all different kinds of clients in all different kinds of ways. And now you serve one very specific kind of client in a very focused and holistic way, which I think yeah. is really inspiring. Because I think there's a lot of gym owners out there who are just wearing too many hats, pulling themselves in too many directions. And it's not that you all aren't busy still. <laughs> it's just that you're focused on yeah. one particular kind kind kinds of problem that you're solving for specific kind yeah. of athlete. Yeah. I think it's interesting because I think one of our fears at the time was if we put ourselves in this really narrow box of mm -hmm. female athletes, female softball player, that we wouldn't get enough respect. Like, I really think that there was something like that for us because, you know, the comparison for us is baseball and baseball is MLB and you can have big names and you can work with really sort of like high level people. Um, and it's interesting because in the past three years, since we've sort of narrowed to softball athlete, we have worked with MLB players who have come into our facility because of our knowledge base. We've spoken at baseball conferences to MLB professionals. You know, I have calls all the time with high people in MLB asking about hiring some of our staff. So I, I think I would just say, don't shy away from being really good at what you do. And then people will still find you and you'll yeah. still get to do high level things because no one is actually scared of working with a softball coach if they're, you know, in some other uh, industry, if you have a really strong expertise in that. So I think part of our fears early on was we were going to box ourselves off too much. And that really has not been the case. Um, if anything, it's given us way more opportunities uh, like this, talking on the podcast, like Unicorn Society, like, you know, all of the, the yep. good opportunities we've had from that. Yeah, good for you. I think that's really well said. And I think you're not alone. I think there's a lot of people when they start a gym that part of what they want is to be recognized in the industry as being really great, mm -hmm. to be really a really great contribution to their, their corner of the industry. And by niching down and really focusing on a specific kind of person, it can there can be that, that fear of like, oh, I'm not going to be able to make as big an impact as I wanted to make because I'm focused on a very specific thing. But that's not the case. Right. <laughs> you're having real expertise in a specific corner of fitness and specifically sports performance is really valuable, right? Yeah. People will come to you even if you niche down. So yeah, great example. So one of the things that, that's 
that's come over the last three years as you've, if, as you've gotten more focus on who you're serving in the business is you all have a really fantastic assessment process. And I'm mentioning this because I think a lot of, a lot of people who listen to this podcast um, have an assessment process that they use for sales, but it's not very dialed in. It's not very dialed in. I don't think it really resonates with their clients. It's one of those things where maybe they're taking them through an FMS or maybe they're just doing like a basic movement screen or they're having some conversation about goals. But for many of them, it doesn't really come together into a really unique experience that helps convert clients. And what you all do is your assessment's actually a paid product. Yeah. Your assessment for when new athletes come in, it's a real experience that they pay for because it comes with a lot of data and stuff that I'm sure you'll explain in a second. But I wanted to, so listeners, I wanted to share this. I want Krista to share this with all, all of you, because if you do an initial assessment for folks right now, um, there's a lot of great ideas you can steal from Krista and her team about how to make that assessment really magical, really resonant with them. So can you talk a little bit about how your assessment works? Sure. So we started our assessment just because everyone did assessments and it was not a paid product. It was just something that we started uh, randomly applying to our athletes because we wanted to individualize their training. Um, and we started realizing that in our space uh, specifically, no one had this information. So you couldn't just do an assessment and then say like, see what we found because you were pointing to nothing. And so we started building an assessment. And for us, because there was no information out there. So I think you know, specific to us, but I think there are a lot of areas like this where there are, where, you know, I think of me and my training environment as a woman, when I go to my gym, you know, I want to know specific information about how am I going to train as a woman based on my age and based on all these things. And for us as sort of these teenage to early 20 softball players, there wasn't information on them. And so what our assessment process became is an education resource. It's a really, really powerful education resource that kicks off their journey with us. And so as we were realizing how powerful it was for people, you know, I referenced at the Unicorn Society retreat that people cry sometimes in our session. They just see themselves. They, they feel like they're being heard and being seen by us really finding out how they move, you know, what their performance numbers are on the skill side. They feel really seen by that. And we realized how powerful this was. So we started pushing it as you know, almost a standalone product, although mm -hmm. almost everyone trains with us after it. Um, and when we focus really on telling their story, making it sure it tied to why we thought things should be the way that they are, our, mm -hmm. you know, as we're learning about each athlete, it ties to why you should train a certain way or how you're going to reach your goals. And they feel really powerful yesterday, actually we had, or two days ago, we had someone in from out of town and I heard her dad say, we feel like we work, it's not a work ethic thing. Like, look at all she's accomplished. And we feel like we've been working so hard. And this is the first time we feel like, ah, like, I'm not just going to be working hard for no reason. I feel like I see exactly where to go and what my story is. Uh, we sort of gotten this tagline of come know your story, which actually our athletes started using on their own. And we just kind of uh, adopted from them. And so I think that's really what it was for us was we needed more education around this and people wanted to come get that. And so it became this product for us. So I think if there's an area in your market where you think, ah, you know, our athletes or our clients don't know X, Y, Z, they don't know how to train, you know, a woman for me, I didn't know what training should look like post kids. So if an assessment can be tied to something like that, and I can feel like I really understand why I should then invest in your gym or, or your training, I think it became, you know, it's really, really powerful. And we've just had it's been pretty unbelievable what it's become for us. And so it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's amazing. And I love that that kind of tagline is like, come to this assessment and, and know your story, learn your story, right? And I think that so many folks looking are looking for help from a gym, from a trainer, from a facility like yours, because they're feeling stuck. Because what mm -hmm. they've been trying is not working or what they've been trying is, you know, they're motivated to keep doing what they've been doing. So they're at that pivotal moment where their story is changing, where they want to change right. their story. And so when you can have an assessment that helps, helps them be seen, helps them be heard, helps them learn a little bit about why what they've been doing is not working or why they've been unmotivated and help them to start to see what it would look like to turn a corner, right? That is so critical. So can you just break it down a little bit into like, what are the things you actually do with them? I know you're are going to be very specific to yep. your, you know, your, the skills your, your folks care about. Can you just break that down maybe into some smaller components about how the assessment actually works? Sure. So we measure performance numbers. So that would be mm -hmm. the skill side of things. Um, and then we also measure how the athletes move. So 
some mobility measurements that are really specific to softball athletes, some uh, movement capacities, we call what we call it, but it's trunk control. So pelvis and chest relationship through different movements. And then we tie that story together. So one of the things I talked about at the Unicorn Society Retreat is that we used to lead with the movement part because mm. we feel like that's very important. A lot of our athletes are teenagers. They're not good movers. They're not good rotators. So when you're talking about the skill, it's like it, there's a lot to tackle before we can really get good at the skill. But what we realized is that our clients do not care about that part as much. They care about how do I throw harder? How do I have more break on the ball? How do I hit home runs? They care about the performance numbers. So we really changed our story and we always start with performance. Um, we, we sort of describe them as an athlete. And then we tie why the movement stuff that we measure, why the mobility stuff that we measure is important if they want to change the performance numbers. So it's really a way for us to get buy-in to the type of training that we believe will get them there um, by telling a story in a particular way that really ties to what they care about. So an example I gave sort of outside of our space was you know, when I went to my gym, the very first thing they did was put me on an in-body scale. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was so interesting because I didn't say I wanted to lose weight. I don't care at all about my weight, actually. I just want to feel better. You know, I am in a different body post kids. I want a lot of energy for my kids. And so there's a way maybe that weight is important for that. Um, but I thought it was interesting because that didn't create buy-in for me into the program mm -hmm. of seeing that scale go down was not something I was chasing. And so I think when you're thinking of an assessment, there's things that you're going to think are important as the trainer and as the salesperson. And then, but that doesn't always mesh exactly with the, mm -hmm. the client. Um, and so making sure that you're leading with what the client cares about, uh, obviously not sacrificing your, your values or anything, but for us, it was leading the story with what they cared about to make them buy in to what we cared about and how we thought that they could get there. Yeah, I think it's beautifully said, Krista. And I think that's an, a, that's an approach to assessments that regardless of who your client is, makes sense, mm -hmm. right? Start with it. You can take them through whatever assessments you want and care about as a trainer and matter to your approach to program design, whether that's FMSs or in-body scans or anything else you can think of. And you can use that information, but it has to come second to what they care about, <laughs> right? right? Whether they care about throwing harder or being able to um, walk on the beach with their loved ones or hold their grandchildren or sleep through the night right. or just, you know, whatever that is, that um, that has to come first in the storytelling. And I love that you put that first. It's like, what performance do they care about in their life? And that has to be the entry point into teaching them about why what you do can help them get there. Right. And I think that often people are putting the cart before the horse in the way that you described. So I think that's, mm -hmm. yeah, fantastic. You know, what other, when it comes to telling the story and, and having that, have them walk away with a really clear picture, any other tips for listeners? Cause I find so often when trainers go to do this or salespeople, they get, they kind of get lost along the on the road. It's a lot of information to handle in one sit down session of all the things that people want, all the assessment information. Any tips for being able to navigate that in like a really clear way so people can walk away with with real focus? Yeah, practice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think do it um, and talk about what went well and what didn't. I think one of the things we've done over the years is, you know, if Ashley's leading the debrief or the storytelling session, we call it, um, she'll come back sometimes and say that did not go well. That one did not go well. Like I could see the parents' eyes like, ah, you know, or I want to early on a couple of times we heard people would say like this was, that was like drinking out of a, you know, fire hydrant. And they were not saying that positively, like it felt <laughs> too much. Um, and we really listened to that. So I think don't be afraid to, you know, listen to the feedback that someone's giving you in those sessions and, and practice them and then go back to your team and say, you know, that one really went well. Let's talk about why that one went well, or that one really didn't. And that experience was what caused us to sort of change our story. To, you know, the story that we were telling over time was that we listened to the mm -hmm. feedback we were getting from our clients. And when they would say, you know, <clears throat> but when am I going to get better at pitching? Like all we talked about in this assessment was mobility or when they would, you know, give feedback li like that, or we would lose them really early, you know, after training, they weren't bought in. They, they stopped training right away after that. We really listened to that feedback to build a better story. So I think what I would say is really practice, do it, <laughs> um, give your best shot at what you think your, your storytelling or your assessment process should look like your sales call, you know, it's similar. Um, and then listen to the feedback that they're giving you. Don't be afraid of 
saying that did not go great. Uh, that, you know, the feedback or it was, it, it was, a, we got there, we got there, they bought or they, they did it, but it took too many turns for us to get there. So that was another thing that we went through. You know, we had people come in and they weren't ready for the assessment. So we've made little videos that they watched beforehand. Like we've added a lot of pieces to really make that storytelling session stick and make them buy in in it. Um, and that has come from just practice and listening to the feedback that they're giving us. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, that's exactly it. Just get in the reps. I think that's great advice. Just go do it and do it and do it. Listen to see how it goes. Listen to your own feelings about how it's going yourself. <laughs> yeah. How comfortable do you feel at different moments? And then you will tweak this over time, but you just got to practice. So yeah, I think that's stellar advice. Thanks, Krista. Mm -hmm. Well, let's um, let's move on. There's one more topic I want to cover. And I think we have the time. So it's a little bit of a pivot. But yep. one of the things I meant, you said before we started recording that I think you, know, that you seem to have a that you have a lot of experience with that I think is really would be useful to talk about with our, with our listeners is the fact that you and your business partner, Ashley are both working moms who own a business full time, but are also the kind of primary kind of caregivers at home that yeah. you are doing both and bless you. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's a lot to juggle and to have two people who are co-owning this at the same time doing that position. I'm sure you're not alone. I mean, we have a lot of women listening who are the primary caretakers at home while also running their business. So I just want to hear a little bit about how you both, you and Ashley, <clears throat> excuse me, navigate that. You mean you personally, but then also as a partnership, what are some things you've learned that work and don't work over the years? I think my biggest advice on this, and I, you know, I kind of brought up that I want to talk about this because I do think it's very unique about us. We're also in the coaching space. So it's very unique in the coaching space to to be women um, at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then to be moms and be primary caregivers is, is kind of a unique um, situation that we're in. And I think the biggest advice I would say is don't pretend you're not in that situation. Mm -hmm. I think what we did early on was uh, try to just follow a business model that was already out there. And those business models were built around men who were not the primary caregivers. I mean, that is just the reality of it. And so I think for us, you know, we're not perfect at it. And it's definitely a struggle a lot to juggle this. I think coaching for all of us is, an, is sort of servant leadership. It's, you know, more giving. And so sometimes that feels like a lot when then also you come home and that's, your kids are expecting that same thing. And, you know, your husband or your partner is expecting the same thing. And so I think for us, it's, just saying we're different. We are run by women. We are run by moms. We have boundaries and limitations to what we can do as a business that are different mm -hmm. than, you know, some of our competitors. We don't have to beat them by being them. That's just not realistic for us. So what are the sort of boundaries that we have to put around that? And I think, you know, that is really important. We did not always do that. Uh, both of us mm -hmm. took two weeks off for all of our children, um, which is, I would not recommend and do not do that. But that was when we were in a phase of, we have to get back in there. We can't take time off. You know, our, our competitors aren't doing that. I think we've grown a lot of what are the limitations that we need to have and just understanding what is unique about us. If my son, I get a phone call that my son is sick and I have to go get him, I have to go get him and I can't go into work that day. And that's just the reality of our situation. And so making sure that people understand that instead of trying to hide it. I really think we yeah. spent a lot of years of hiding <laughs> that part of us to try to pretend it wasn't there and that we didn't have those limitations, which I don't think is the right way to go. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I, I think that that, that, that first thing you said really resonates with me that like, you know, the business model we think of, of a gym owner or business owner in general is, is a archetype of a man who right. works all the time and doesn't mm -hmm. have any other duties at home. <laughs> yeah. And that is a broken model. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. a broken model. Not only is that not true for a lot of men these days, but it's never been the case for most women. Uh, and the fact that, you know, that that's the thing we often feel ourselves comparing ourselves to is so ridiculous and unfair and unhelpful. So I love that you start with like, let's just not compare ourselves to this thing. That's just not true. <laughs> we, right. we have other priorities uh, besides work and that's not just uh, okay. That's good. <laughs> that's actually we, the way we want our lives. We want to have families that we spend time and prioritize. 
spend time with them, prioritize. So maybe can you give me, the listeners just a few examples. What are some of the boundaries that you and or Ashley feel like you've put in place that were helpful in creating more of a balance between home life and work life? I think, I think we're working on this every day. So, yeah, you know, I think it's something yeah. that we can keep getting better at, but one of the things, so I also coach a team um, and it's a lot. We coach in the, I go to tournaments on the weekend and that is a lot and I'm exhausted from it. And I don't see my kids a lot of time on those weekends. So one of the things I did was that when I coach on the, on the weekends, I take Mondays off and I'd say mm-hmm. like, no go, do not contact Krista day. Um, I will not answer if you message me. I need time to rejuvenate for myself and spend time with my kids. Um, so we've just done little things like that. I think we're mm-hmm. we're still exploring how to do that best um, inside of our business. But I think That's the understanding that we need to, it's it's not always even just about like, and then I want to spend time with my kids, which is a really important part, but also, and then I need to rejuvenate. I need some self-care <laughs> because yep. every, you know, I spent this morning before this podcast, getting my kids out the door, getting them ready. And then I have to jump on this and I have to go to work. And there's a lot of juggling of that. So I think that's an example. Um, and I think just some limitations around, we have, we were sort of uh, on all the time for our athletes and their families. So I think just learning how to put some, be very responsive, like we care about them very deeply and we want them to feel like they can connect with us, but putting boundaries around what that looks like and the understanding that we have families that we also have to give to. Um, So I think just trying to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those are great examples. I mean, even just the one where like, Hey, when I work on weekends, I take off on Mondays. Simple, yeah. right? It's a simple boundary to be like, that's just, I just, it's necessary for my own self care. It's not more time with the kids. In fact, yeah. I want time with nobody on Mondays. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I want everyone to leave me the hell alone, right? Yeah. I mean, fantastic example. I think you're the one about clients is also critical because I think early on in businesses, we just, and we want to be responsive to the clients, right? This is what we're there for is to support them and be available, but we can't be available 24 seven. We're not an emergency room. Right? Yeah. And so having some clear boundaries of this is this is when you can expect to get email responses from me, text responses if you're in a texting relationship with clients. Um, and these are the days I'll make myself available. These are the days I'm not. Right? So I think those are great ongoing boundaries to set uh, for anyone listening to this podcast. Yeah. But I think it becomes particularly um, relevant when you also are responsible for taking care of other little humans. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think those are great tips. Let's let's leave that there. I think we probably come back and have any one of these topics be a whole other podcast. So we'll have to have you come back to next yeah. time. Maybe come back with Ashley. We can, we can yeah, have a, for sure. some chats together. Um, but thanks for doing this, Krista. I think we covered a lot of ground from talking about how to niche down and bring some focus to your services and who you serve in your business to creating stories with your assessments and making sure those assessments are really resonant and focused on what your clients really want to get out of your work together. Uh, and then I think there's some great tips here for setting boundaries as a, you know, as a badass working mom and business partner with another working mom. And so covered a lot of ground. Thanks for this great conversation. Yeah, um, as, awesome. we wrap, as we wrap things up, how can people learn more about S2 Breakthrough or follow you on the interwebs? Yeah, s2breakthrough.com or s2 underscore breakthrough is our handle on Instagram and Twitter are probably the places you would find us most. Yeah, awesome. Well, fantastic. Thanks again for doing this. Listeners, if you enjoy this podcast, leave us a review on all the places where you review podcasts. This one's worth at least five stars, don't you think? Yeah, Yeah, for sure. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, And also shoot me an email if there's anyone you want me to talk to next or any topic you want us to cover, michael at businessphoenixwins.com. Thanks so much for listening and I'll see you on the next one. 